All righty. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's nice to see you all logging on um, and fabulous to see so many of our colleagues joining us from Anthology. We have a great session in store for everybody. Uh, but before I turn it over to Mirka, who's going to lead us through a large part of today's uh, presentations, um, I'm just going to walk over through the usual bit of housekeeping that we do at the beginning of any Advancement Academy training. Um, you guys probably already know what's in store. Uh, so I'm going to invite everybody to open up your participants window. Um, this is a fabulous window to keep open throughout today's session to get a sense of who else is here in the meeting with us um, and who is kind of coming off of mute to share or raise a hand. Uh, so good idea to just keep that open off to the side um, as we're here today. Uh, and while you're in there, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and find your name in that list of participants and hover your cursor over it. Uh, you're looking to get the three horizontal dots to be able to click into and be able to select rename. Uh, and I'm going to also ask everybody to make sure that your first and last name is appearing on there. Um, and if you could also add in your CSU University, that'd be fabulous. Um, that way we get a sense of where everybody's joining us from. For our anthology colleagues, if you guys could just type in anthology at the end of your display name, that would be awesome as well, just so everybody can recognize you. Um, and I'll just give everybody here just a couple seconds to go ahead and click into their display name and add in their CSU. Um, and in the meantime, it's going to be awesome to learn where everybody's joining us from. Wow, fabulous. Good, nice, nice representation across the CSU here. Alrighty. Um, and as we continue today's session, I just want to uh, provide some couple tips for conversation. Uh, it's probably best if you stay on mute if you're not actively speaking. That just cuts down on the possibility of, you know, your dog barking or a colleague walking in, um, and that just creating some noise for, for our presenters. Um, if you do have a thought to share throughout the session, please go ahead and electronically raise your hand, um, and either our presenter or our facilitators will get to you as soon as we can. Um, neat thing about an electronic hand is that we won't lose you in the video if you flash your hand. Um, um, and then uh, we create a nice little queue in the participants window in terms of who raises their hand in what order. Um, and of course, uh, throughout today's session, the chat is open, as many of us have discovered it already. That's a good place to ask the group questions, um, uh, drop in any links that we might reference later, um, and then you should be able to save the chat at the end of today's session to uh, archive any of the fun information that was shared there as well. Uh, so. Also uh, want to make the note too, to electronically raise your hand, you hit reactions and then uh, the raise hand button and that'll uh, shoot up your hand right away. Uh, and uh, the Q&A uh, feature in Zoom is enabled today. Uh, we did get some slight technical difficulties with this at the beginning of the pre-check, uh, but go ahead and check out the, uh, uh, your Zoom menu and see if you can find the Q&A feature. If you can't find it, the, the chat is a perfect place, to uh, alternate place to put in your questions either to me or to our presenters. Uh, so we look forward to, to seeing those there. And the session is being recorded, as you've noticed, um, and it's going to be posted shortly after uh, tomorrow's session, both videos on the Advancement Academy YouTube channel. Uh, and I'm going to be sending out the link to those videos uh, to everybody that's registered via email. So stay tuned for that. And with this last point, I will stop my screen share and turn things over to Mirko. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sam. And thanks everyone for joining today. You're making me feel a little bit better. The fact that it's not 70 degrees already in the morning where you are, at least for some of you. So compared to the 30 to some degrees or 30 degrees we have with a little bit of snow on the ground in Pennsylvania, which is where I'm based. Uh, just to confirm, you should now be able to see my screen. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, uh, like Sam said, we're excited to be here with you today. There are a number of my colleagues who are on as well. Uh, you'll be hearing from three of us primarily during the day today. Uh, so I will take you through uh, sort of the first section of the day, which is all around uh, looking at engagement um, strategies and opportunities. And then I think Jen is going to jump in with some information from SDSU on that same topic. Uh, we will then have um, our Director of Product Management joining us to give you an update on where we are uh, uh, related to the roadmap and sort of how they're looking at roadmap for uh, the next year. Uh, so Heather will join us for that. And uh, then Brendan is going to uh, cover the sort of the last section of today, which is more focused on events and growing event engagement and sharing some great examples there. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll cover email communications and giving related topics. Uh, and I think Corrine uh, is joining us as well later to um, give uh, uh, share some information from Fresno State uh, on uh, events also. So looking forward to all of that today. As Sam said, please jump in with questions, comments, et cetera, either using the chat or raising your hand. This is a lot more fun for us uh, if uh, you participate and ask questions so we can make sure to cover what's most important and relevant for you. 
Uh, with that, I am going to go ahead and dive in if my mouse does what I want it to do. Uh, so there we go. Uh, we are going to start, like I said, with talking about uh, ways to grow engagement. And uh, I want to start here with this, which is some things to think about as you uh, look at programs, content, all of those elements. Uh, so for me, one of the key things uh, in looking at websites is uh, maybe shifting the mindset if, if you're not there already. I know a lot of you think in these terms, but always think about your constituents first. Uh, so if I know nothing about uh, the alumni association, the alumni office, whatever it may be, uh, can I easily understand what's going on on the site? And are these the things that I want to see on, on the website as well? Uh, so we'll share some examples uh, throughout the morning uh, that sort of cover that. And again, hopefully give you some things to think about. Make sure you uh, focus on calls to action uh, on your website and in your communications Look at the wording you're using. Uh, this, I think, is less of an issue on the alumni engagement side of the house, where I sometimes scratch my head is on the, the giving side when I see annual um, giving or the annual fund called out a lot, or um, major gifts or leadership gifts, right? Those are terms that constituents won't necessarily understand or donors won't be familiar with. So really look at what wording you're using and think about ways to shift that wording to be terms that make sense for your constituents. Always with your website, look at incorporating trends. We'll look at some examples of having video on sites and some other examples um, throughout the morning as well. And then uh, along with assessing wording, I think it sort of goes with that inside out language where we're talking about some of our structures sometimes versus really uh, what our constituents are looking for and, and what they're more focused on. Um, so hopefully that makes sense so far. Um, before I dive into those examples, I did want to take a step back um, with some reminders around Google Analytics 4. Uh, this came actually out of um, a, a small group we met with from the CSU campuses of topics that would be of interest to, to the larger group. Uh, so just a couple of reminders. Um, hopefully you're all, you've all heard of GA4. Uh, but uh, even if you haven't, uh, some reminders here. So first of all, Universal Analytics is ending on July 1st of this year. Uh, so if you do have Google Analytics on your site right now and you haven't migrated it to GA4, uh, keep that date in the back of your mind uh, that as of July 1, uh, Universal Analytics will no longer be supported. On our side, we added support for Google Analytics 4 in our January release. So you can, if you haven't already, you can now migrate your Google Analytics to GA4. Uh, and our recommendation is that you migrate that within Google Analytics itself, because that will ensure that the data from Universal Analytics, right? So from what you've had on your site so far will be retained and you'll be able to do that comparison. Uh, once you've completed that migration in uh, Google Analytics, you'll get an embed code. You can share that with our support team. They can add it to your site or you can also add it to your site on your own. And if you have questions on that, definitely let me know in the chat. The screenshot is the new view of analytics. So that's a view of GA4. For those of you who have been using Google Analytics before, uh, it does look a little bit different. Um, so I asked our um, marketing team, um, our web team actually, to put together some, some sort of tips and tricks uh, because they have made the adjustment uh, to GA4 already. So in their words, the dashboard looks very different. Um, things are labeled differently. It's, things are called different things. But uh, one of the key things is that all of the information that you're used to seeing is still there. It might just take a little bit um, to find it. Uh, one of the changes that um, Google has made is there's more of a focus on active time on the page. Uh, so uh, they're actually looking at, do you have the, the browser open um, as sort of the primary window that you're looking at? Uh, are you scrolling or engaging with the content on the page? Some of those actions are now being tracked. Um, the good news for all of you who are using UTMs, there's no change at all related to UTMs with the GA4 rollout. It's more the analytics from the, the, the page. And again, if you're somewhat new to analytics or new to GA4, our team recommends starting with the report snapshot. They, As they were showing this to me, um, they pointed out that's where most of the information that you might be used to seeing in Google Analytics and Universal Analytics lives now. Uh, so where are users coming from, the pages with the most views, those types of, of pieces of content. Uh, so as you start in GA4, start with that report snapshot. Um, and then the other thing, um, look at some of those engagement events. So the clicking, scrolling, the, the start of engagement on a page. 
Uh, and then just a reminder in terms of a best practice, uh, if you are looking at, if, or if you have made some changes to your site or to pages on your site, uh, use that 90 day window to see if there's uh, differences in engagement. Um, that's what our team uses to assess whether uh, something has led to people staying on a page more or going to other pages because of the content on a page. Uh, they said looking at anything less than that may not be as telling. Uh, so something to keep in mind, and if you're just looking at trends over time without making significant changes, look at six months to um, year over year trends, uh, those periods would be what they recommend and what I would recommend as well. All right, I know that was sort of detailed info right to begin with, but I did want to cover that first as we talk about web design and web strategy. Uh, hopefully that all made sense. Again, if you have other questions, just uh, let us know. Now moving to the more fun part, which is starting to look at some examples of websites and how other uh, uh, Encompass schools are using that to engage with constituents. So here we have an example from Miami University of Ohio. They actually just rolled out this new site in the fall of last year. Uh, and let me go ahead and try to bring it up on my screen as well. We'll see how fast my browser is this morning. Uh, there you go. Uh, so you can see that the top of the page, right, is very image oriented, um, call to action oriented, uh, and they've got a couple of image rotators here that they've chosen to include. And um, they actually have an alumni site and then a separate giving site. And we'll look at that giving site tomorrow. But um, something to keep in mind, uh, some of our larger schools do distinguish between the two and actually separate out those websites. Uh, so again, um, that way donors can go right to the, the site that is of most interest to them or potential donors, especially friends of the institution who aren't alums. As they were making this change, they uh, wanted to align to the new brand standards that had been rolled out by their marketing communications team. Um, and then they also used it as an opportunity to um, clean up old content. Now, for those of you, I know a lot of you have been with us for a while and you likely have a lot of um, older pages sitting on your site map that don't get touched anymore. So Miami did use this to really clean up that content. So that might be an opportunity as well. They used Google Analytics um, as I'm scrolling through the page to identify pages that weren't getting any hits or, or views and then decided whether that content was still needed. A couple of keys for them. Um, as uh, I'm scrolling, they kept their executive team informed of progress, so there were no surprises on that end. And then the go live, they managed to squeeze in between their homecoming and the launch of their public campaign phase. Now, as you look at the page, you can see there's a lot of imagery on here. There are very clear calls to action. There is a social feed at the bottom. And as I scroll back up quickly, uh, I just wanted to highlight the focus on volunteerism here obviously event participation and updating contact information, but really also using these large color blocks uh, to highlight different parts of the homepage. All right, so hopefully that gives you some ideas, maybe if you are thinking of potential redesign at um, some point in the near future, or just looking at ways to um, update some of the information on your, on your site. Now I'm going to go to another school here that rolled out their website uh, about a month ago at this point. And this is McMaster University, they're up in Canada. And I'll just bring up that example as well because there's some consistencies between what we saw and some differences. So you'll see, first of all, immediately, they have a video um, as their uh, key image on the homepage, which obviously that is engaging, right? That gets people's attention. Um, they do update this about once a quarter. Uh, just jumping back up for a minute to their navigation, they actually reduce the number of items in the navigation with this design, focusing on four. You have you can see the drop down menus here, uh, but their prior site I think had six navigation items at the top, so they really wanted to uh, reduce those and 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 fo focus more attention on them. They do use patternized content blocks here on this site. Um, and the news module, which we'll talk about in a minute from another site to uh, make it easier to update information. And again, as I scroll through, you can see a focus on much more heavy uh, imagery uh, to uh, highlight trends. I do like the alumni story section, uh, but they actually also have a, a separate template for alumni stories. So if I go back to the PowerPoint, you can see that on the right-hand side of your screen. 
uh, and Mitchell has been sharing links in the chat. So uh, he'll also share that link to the alumni stories page if he hasn't already for you to check out. But this is what they really use to highlight um, some of those impactful stories of, of graduates and their successes. All right, uh, going to uh, a slightly different spot uh, is George Mason University uh, in, in the DC area. Uh, they wanted to highlight their regional chapters uh, on their website. So they work with our team to create this map and then highlight sections of the country. As a, a constituent would click on the section, they will see a box that pops up or takes them to, I should say, lower on the page where they can then see the various networks that exist in that part of the country. Now, there are a number of ways you can do that. You don't necessarily need to work with our team to have this type of page. But one of the things that I like about it is that um, it makes it easy for your alumni to see all of the activity or the parts of the country that you're uh, in actively engaging in. And I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. I don't see any questions so far, but um, definitely let me know if any questions pop up. Uh, one of the other areas I thought it made sense to talk about, given what we started talking about at the beginning of the day, is really thinking through your brand voice and your tone on your website and in your communications. And I know a lot of you do this already, but I did want to pull up Louisville's example here uh, of their homepage. This was redesigned in 2019, so it's been a, a while. Um, but you can see they also do have that video. Their, um, their navigation is very straightforward, connect events, services, shop, and about. Uh, but when you start to look at the language they're using, uh, there's this powerful we are family message right um, on that uh, video, uh, the video image. There we go, that's the word. Uh, but then as you scroll further down, um, you have Get Connected. Your alumni office is hard at work creating new engagement opportunities. Um, stay in the know about U of L events. So the language is uh, very conversational. Um, there's not a lot of jargon or slang that's used ever on their site. And this goes through not just their homepage, but their entire site. Uh, so thought that that was interesting. Again, it gives you a chance maybe to take a step back and think about how are you communicating to your audience and is there an opportunity to shift um, to become a little bit more conversational. Uh, now they also wanted to talk through the, the sort of the transformative power of getting a Louisville degree and they do that through storytelling. And uh, you can see one example uh, on the right hand side of the screen here uh, of the various alumni features uh, that they include on the website. And so similar to what we saw with alumni stories with McMaster, this is becoming increasingly common. Uh, both schools are, are pushing out alumni, a new alumni story about every two to three weeks uh, as another way to engage constituents. Those are then being shared on social media. Uh, and uh, they both focus on sort of the career path of that individual, how they're engaging in the community, uh, and uh, those types of elements. Now, for Louisville to get ideas on stories, their team does some of the research, uh, trying to see on LinkedIn what they can find and in other ways, but they also created this advancement communications request area of their site, and you'll see one of them is alumni donor spotlights for the website or social media. So faculty and staff at the institution can go in here and recommend uh, a graduate to be profiled. And I think Mitchell has or will be dropping a link to this chat in here as well. Um, just because uh, this is an interesting way to do this. I don't know if anybody at the CSU institutions is, has created a page like this of internal forms that people can use that are housed in Encompass, uh, just so that they're not having to call or email your, your team or you individually, rather it's coming through a form so you have a way to capture more of that information. Um, if you do have a form like that, feel free to share the link in the chat, uh, but you can see Louisville uses it for email solicitations, uh, for general email communication, so if a faculty or staff member or a department wants to get ideas out, um, they use that as well there. So just something to keep in mind, um, if you are getting lots of emails right now uh, from uh, 
faculty or staff members think about maybe creating a landing page like this with the various forms that they can use to request information. Uh, last example from Louisville. Uh, this one's more focused on, again, that tone uh, and voice. So uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, you have their Happy Holidays email. Uh, here they actually pulled in a campaign uh, that they had used on social media. They created a family feud type um, concept where they asked alums to uh, see if they can guess the number one holiday tradition uh, for Louisville graduates. Uh, so that was the ask that went to Instagram, actually. So again, they're combining social media uh, with email. Uh, and uh, you can see for the email itself, they have a, a GIF or a GIF in the email uh, around the holidays. This email had a 33% open rate uh, and uh, a relatively strong click rate to the family feud type concept. On the left-hand side, you have uh, their newsletter called FYI. The reason I pulled this in is because uh, the team let me know that they actually went from sending this twice a month to only sending it once a month. Uh, but they have a really high readership here. Uh, the open rate on this one was about 37 uh, percent. And a, a lot of the ways that they've done that is really think through the type of content that's going to resonate uh, with their constituents. So they, they took time to track what types of stories alumni were clicking on going back over the last a year plus, and then use that to inform, okay, these are the types of stories that we'll include moving forward. Now, it took some time to build that open rate, uh, but uh, from the last, across the last three years, they've seen continued improvement as they've refined uh, communications and content. While I'm talking about open rates, not to be the bearer of bad news, uh, but if you're not familiar with the Apple iOS changes that happened in September 2021, uh, basically uh, any email that is received on an iOS device in the native mail app of that iOS device will appear as opened. Uh, Apple decided to change privacy settings. So basically, uh, if you are receiving your CSU emails in the native mail app on uh, an iOS, on an Apple phone, it will show that you open every one of your CSU emails that you receive uh, to anybody. This is not just for uh, Encompass, it's for any email provider. The result of that is that open rates have gone up. Uh, we looked at this uh, about six to nine months ago, and on average, open rates increased by about 10 to 15 percent for our clients after the iOS changes. So just something to keep in mind when you're comparing open rates to, uh, a, I guess, two years ago or a year and a half ago at this point, you will see that jump. Uh, so again, um, just be aware of that. And if there are questions on that specifically, feel free to put them in the chat. All right, moving on from Louisville. This is a, a quick example from the uh, Nebraska Alumni Association. Uh, travel programs are coming back. Yay, we can get out of our houses again. Uh, and for Nebraska, they actually, along with bringing travel programs back, they launched a their first young alumni trip. Uh, and they actually branded that as Husker Trek. Uh, it's only open to alumni uh, below the ages of 34. Uh, and when you look at what they're doing, uh, they're, they're staying in uh, hostels and doing different types of activities than certainly your typical travel population might be interested in, uh, i.e. older uh, alums. Uh, but for them, this has proven really successful. There's a lot of interest among younger grads. They work with uh, the travel agency they use to create this web rotator. Uh, they shared information on the trip in social uh, uh, media and through email, as well as in their newsletter. Um, but again, this is just another example of looking at programs and opportunities that speak to specific audiences, right, that resonate with those audiences, and that's uh, another way to build engagement. And uh, again, they branded it as Husker Trek uh, to make it a little bit more appealing to recent alums, and this is a series of, of uh, travel programs they'll continue moving forward. So now they've got that Husker Trek name um, associated with it. Uh, sticking with travel for the first part of this slide, uh, but to give you just an example of, of some of the potential power uh, in Encompass or ways to use Encompass a little bit differently, the focus is here is on news listings and uh, using news listings to um, make it easier for your constituents to find a variety of types of content. 
Uh, so on the, the travel programs, Oklahoma State University uh, adds all of these as news stories and then flags them when they set them up so that it's easy for alumni to search these based on location. Is it a domestic trip or an international trip based on the season that the trip is taking place and based on the type of trip, as you can see. They also use news listings for their grandparent university, which basically allows grandparents to bring their grandchildren to OSU during the summer for a three-day course on a number of different topics. Uh, and uh, there's a filter there as well, which again is done through news listings. So it, it allows you to share a lot of information on a page, but make that information searchable in a relatively easy way for constituents. And I'll walk you through how to do that in more detail in a minute. The last uh, news listing example here from OSU is the uh, graduation checklist that they put together every year. So this is something that they email to all of their new grads to, throughout the year, regardless of when they graduate. So if they're the May or the December grads, uh, and the graduate checklist that you see on the right hand side of your screen, that is actually also a news listing. So it makes it easy for them to identify what they want to highlight throughout the year or what they need to remove, maybe because it doesn't make sense for December grads. So rather than recreating the content uh, and, and updating the, the content block of information, they do this through news stories uh, and then add uh, or remove them as appropriate. Hopefully that all made sense and some of you are already using news listings in that way, but just in case, let me walk you through how you would go about doing this. Uh, so uh, in the Encompass platform, uh, you would first go to content properties, make sure you turn on this filter, that show content filter, uh, because that will allow the, the filter option to show on the content page. Uh, and then you'd select the content types that you would want to show in that specific filter. So you can see this is the trip search listing and they've chosen location, domestic and international. They would also have chosen um, the type options that we saw, land, uh, cruise, whatever those other options were. Uh, and then that's how they would populate on the page. The other step to take is to actually create the news listing type. Uh, so that's over in uh, Manage News Listing Types. If you haven't taken a look at this, uh, definitely think about ways to use this. Uh, and then you would go ahead and just add the news listing type uh, and make sure that, that that news listing type actually is the name you want it to be because that's what shows up in the filter. Uh, so these 2018 ones, those are ones that they've renamed because they're no longer in filters. Just as an example, you wouldn't necessarily want to do that with one that you name. And then when you create news stories, uh, you actually choose what uh, type, listing type, you want that news story to show in. Uh, so you, Or you could go back and edit existing ones. So that's how you could flag them to appear in the filter. You know that was a little bit in the weeds, uh, but hopefully that gave you um, some good steps in terms of how to do this if you're not already doing it on the site and some examples of where you can really leverage news listings. And again, those are available to you today uh, in the Encompass platform and it can make it a lot easier for you to add some content or continue to update content as you go. Uh, two more reminders around news listings. So one is you can also use those for events. Uh, so in this case, this is our demo site. Uh, we have a featured event at the top and then uh, all upcoming events. And you could categorize these by type of event uh, as well. And then the last example from Oklahoma State, you can tell Oklahoma State has put a lot of time into news listings uh, because again, they found it so much easier to work with these. That last example is chapter event areas. Uh, so to make it easy for your constituents to look at a list, pick their chapter or chapters that they're interested in, and then get to the relevant uh, events that are planned for that chapter. Is anybody else using news listings? Um, and if you are, feel free to share in the chat. Um, I do want to pause here for a minute just to see if any questions have come up so far. I don't think I see any in the chat, but um, Jen, I saw you gave a thumbs up to, I'm thinking, news listings. Do you mind just sharing briefly for the group? 
Oh yeah, um, our site is actually a lot of news listings. Uh, we have, um, I mean, our events, we have various event calendars. Um, our news listings, actually what I'm gonna be talking about in just a few minutes is um, also a news, was based off of news listings at first. Um, so obviously our news is a news listing. Um, so yeah, uh, most of our site are just feeds that can be pulled in from anywhere. So it really does make it easier to display the information um, and then share it across the site if you want it to show up in multiple places. So we have like a, well, we don't have any more. We used to have a homepage events feed and um, an events listing feed and a chapters feed and each chapter has their own. So uh, you can put things. We do have a homepage news listing and a, an actual news listing. We have alumni profiles that it could be on the news listing, the home listing and a profile. And it's just one story. So it does really make you, uh, the site way easier to manage. Awesome, Jen. And you just made me realize I forgot a talking point for Oklahoma State, which you just covered, which is that you only create it once and you can populate it in multiple places all across the site. Um, including they push people to the calendar, uh, so they're not creating both a news listing and an event for the travel program. So thank you for that reminder. Um, I just saw, I had a chance while you were talking to scroll through the chat, so I saw some of the questions about uh, open rates and, and that um, SDSU is no longer really looking at open rates. Uh, I, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, but uh, it's certainly something to keep in mind regardless, even if you are still looking at open rates, know that they're not nearly as valid as they used to be, because you do have that large population that will just show as opening um, the email because they're um, being pulled into that iOS uh, grouping. So something to think about, uh, the more relevant data would be your click rate. So to see who is actually taking that next step of engaging. And those are still valid metrics. Uh, so in order for uh, a click to appear, somebody actually has to have taken that action, regardless of what um, device they're happening to open the email on. Uh, uh, so yeah, definitely as you think through email metrics, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, uh, but keep in mind that uh, open rate is no longer as, as relevant or beneficial as it was a year and a half to two years ago. Uh, before iOS made those changes. All right, any other questions before I share just a few more examples here? Okay. Uh, so uh, sticking with Encompass and, and aspects of the tool that are already available to you or that are inherently built into the platform are class notes. Uh, I'm not sure anybody uses the class notes feature um, from um, the CSU schools. If you do, please share that in the chat and I might call on you or if you prefer not to, I won't. Um, Jen does, perfect. Uh, maybe you touch on that in the section, um, but it, it's not in your presentation. Okay, I might call on you anyway. Um, so uh, Mitchell just shared the link to uh, Albany Law, uh, but this is something, admittedly it's a law school, but class notes are really important to this group because they share promotions and other news. And it's really part of the culture that they've built at Albany Law. Uh, they have the class notes in front of login, which if you click on the link that Mitchell shared with you, you would be able to see exactly what I have pulled up on my screen, on the left-hand side of my screen. Uh, but. Uh, and then um, to create a class note, you do have to be logged in. Um, so that's what you would want, right? But the, the fact that everybody can access the class notes is a nice feature. You're not putting that barrier of login uh, in front of your constituents to be able to access the class notes that have been submitted. A couple of cool things that Albany Law does with this is they send a personalized email out after a class note has been added. The way they do that is they actually check a box on the member record so in the, the back end of the system in the profile, and that triggers that email to go every day for newly added class notes. Not surprisingly, I and mean, we're talking about five, six a day sometimes, maybe just one or two, maybe none. Um, but not surprisingly, that really personal email has a very high click rate, 55% click rate on that email, which is basically a congratulations of, we're so thrilled um, you chose to share your news with us. Uh, that type of message. So it's a nice follow-up um, for the team. 
the team does put in most of the class notes. They're shared with the team by alums, uh, but quite honestly, it's usually coming through email, uh, not necessarily alums going in and adding class notes. Um, but so that's why when the team adds them on behalf of alums, they send out that automatic-ish email. Uh, they also feature class notes in the newsletter, um, which is what you see on the right-hand side of your screen. This goes about every six weeks. They have different types of connector newsletters, or sorry, alumni newsletters. The connector one, which goes, like I said, roughly every six weeks, features class notes primarily, but also has some other content. And then the other cycles, they have one that's more focused on events and one that's a more general newsletter, uh, but they change the names of the newsletter slightly to reflect what the primary content um, of the newsletter is. The class notes are always the most clicked on part of the content in the newsletter uh, when they're featured, uh, and it leads to more class notes, not surprisingly. Uh, just to give you some stats, uh, Albany Law is a relatively small institution. Again, it's a, it's a law school specifically, but in 2022, they had 266 class notes uh, that were added to the system. Uh, a little bit more than 5% were added by alums themselves. The rest of them were added by the uh, alumni engagement team. But they're definitely getting interest from constituents, uh, and it's a nice way to recognize and engage constituents as well because they're providing that content to them. Uh, one other thing that Albany Law does is they add uh, obituaries for recently passed alums as class notes also, just so that people in the class can see who um, has recently passed. So it's a slightly different way to um, use class notes, but that's something that the team does and has been well received uh, by their graduates. Jen, do you have a quick um, uh, element to share about class notes? Well, I'm going to be sharing a lot more about our class notes in my presentation. Oh. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Um, I'm teeing you up really well here. You um, really are. Thank you. My pleasure. That's what it's about. All right. Uh, I didn't see anything else in the chat related to class notes. But again, if you're not, if you haven't looked at this functionality in a while, we did update it probably about a year and a half, two years ago, something it might be longer ago with COVID. It's hard to keep track of when things changed. Uh, but so uh, it's, it's definitely more updated than it used to be. Uh, and worth perhaps looking at just as another way potentially to engage constituents. And you'll hear Jen and SDS use great examples in a little bit. Uh, so uh, a couple of other examples uh, that I wanted to share today. Uh, this one is actually one of those quick wins, I think, from um, the Nebraska Alumni Association. Jen, if you have a digital monthly calendar, I apologize that I'm stealing all of your thunder here. Um, but uh, they do a monthly uh, digital calendar that they make available at the beginning of every month uh, to not only members of the Alumni Association, but all grads. Uh, and uh, the clicks on this based on the newsletter are actually really high. It's one of their top visited pages or top five visited pages every month. Uh, so people do go and actually download uh, the digital calendar ha to have that. Gives them a little bit, a bit of that Nebraska uh, feel, uh, and you can see two examples of the, the digital calendars on your screen. It is shared, um, like I mentioned, in social. It's shared in the monthly e-newsletter uh, as a story uh, and uh, in uh, a few other ways as well, just in communications with uh, members specifically. But this is one of those things where they're leveraging existing uh, photos that have been taken by central marketing communications and then just overlaying the, the calendar aspect to it, saving them on a content page and making them available. And I think one of the things we saw during the pandemic is that uh, this type of content, whether it's a, a monthly calendar or some of the games or other activities that we, we promoted at that point, while not all of that is still resonating with constituents, there are pieces that can still um, be repeated relatively easily without a lot of work. Um, and then if there are some constituents that take advantage of it, um, to me at least, that's still a win. So something to think about in terms of what you're offering to constituents today, in addition to all of the programming that we're all back to doing, both virtually and in person, but there are some of those ni these nice uh, smaller touch points as well that people will take advantage of. Uh, along those same lines, I wanted to talk about uh, 
the possibility of providing career resources or something I should say that uh, the uh, PCOM, the Pennsylvania College of Optometric Medicine, I believe, if I have that right, does. Uh, and uh, they actually created a job board using, uh, take a wild guess here, uh, a news uh, listing or a news content block at least. So we see news coming back up repeatedly here as an easy way to uh, provide content. Uh, so they they did create that job board. They found that their alums were not using link, the LinkedIn group as much to share jobs. And yet there was a need for that, especially from younger graduates. Uh, so th their team actually takes it on. Uh, they don't get a ton of uh, postings, which they figured they wouldn't. So this is not a lot of additional work, uh, but it's something the team does on a regular basis. Again, just to make those postings available. Um, you can see uh, it's just a listing here. Uh, and because they're setting these up as news items, they can set the end date on the postings automatically so that the postings roll off when the position uh, has closed. Uh, so again, one other thing to uh, give students or give alumni a way to engage, they share this on social media twice a month. It's also in their uh, alumni newsletter that goes out once a quarter, actually, uh, and they include it in their print magazine as well. When they launched this about two, two and a half years ago, they had a larger story in the print magazine. And then every time that they do promote this, they get several job postings uh, for grads. Uh, so again, it's not a ton of postings, but it definitely shows that they've listened to their grads and are finding other ways to support, especially recent grads. They have also moved it into the navigation on the main page, which you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. And that was when they redesigned their site about a year and a half ago. Uh, so they wanted to give more prominence to the job board as part of that. All right, a couple of more examples, I think, before we turn it over to Jen. So this one um, is, again, uh, a little bit detailed here in terms of ways to use Encompass. Uh, but uh, the Oklahoma State University Alumni Association has a board of directors. Uh, they had previously used some other platform to uh, create a dashboard for the board of directors. Uh, but now they've migrated that to Encompass. It's behind login, and it's only available to people with specific roles. Uh, so just a reminder that within Encompass, you can restrict access based on the type of role um, that is set per each profile. So the only people who have access to this are members of the board of directors uh, and uh, their executive uh, team and staff at the OSU Alumni Association. So why did they choose to do this? Again, it reduces, uh, it eliminates another vendor they were using just for this page, but it also um, got board members into uh, the alumni site on a regular basis. They share upcoming meeting information. They share uh, documents and links. Uh, I think this actually goes out to a Google Drive um, is where they house the documents and links that they share. They have, you can see on the bottom, a directory of the, not only the leadership, but all of the board members uh, as you would scroll down the page. Uh, and then they have information about each of their committees as well uh, with minutes from the, the committee meetings, a member list, all of those types of, of elements, and then upcoming alumni events also. Uh, so this has worked really well for them. They've gotten good feedback from their board. Uh, and again, it encourages the board to log into their alumni site, which means they'll also see some of the other great content that is on the site uh, and not have to remember multiple logins to different systems to access information. And then the last example I have, and then I'll open it up to more questions or comments if anyone has any. Uh, this is around podcasts. I think we talked about podcasts probably last year or the year before as well. Uh, but I did want to highlight this from Murray State University. Uh, Carrie McGinnis, who's actually the director of alumni relations there, was a radio personality for a while. So she has moved that um, to still do that um, on the alumni relations side. She co-hosts this podcast with a 2019 grad. Uh, which I thought was a nice touch. Uh, and the reason I wanted to highlight this one specifically is um, the one that's pulled up on the right-hand side of the screen. They did a podcast in early February about alumni uh, helping admissions recruit. So they brought in a number of people from the admissions team to talk through opportunities for alumni to help. 
Uh, and that lines up really well with the alumni survey that we'd done, which I think we talked about briefly last June. But what that showed us is that alumni are very interested in helping with admissions. 30% of recent alumni said that they would be happy to help admissions recruit, and 20% of all graduates uh, would be happy to do that. So just a reminder here, I know that's a little bit more challenging at times to partner with admissions, to see if there's interest from admissions, all of those things. Uh, but if you can find ways to build that partnership and engage alumni to help with recruitment, uh, that may be a win for both sides. Although admittedly, I think the CSU system has enrollment numbers that are relatively strong compared to the rest of the country where we're facing the demographic cliff, at least on the East Coast. Uh, but still, an opportunity to uh, engage alumni with something that they're interested in. Uh, there, and there's actually more opportunity than you think, Mirko. There, okay. there, um, we're feeling a little bit of that dip. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Then I'm glad I, I added this in um, for this group specifically. Uh, so uh, definitely think about ways to do that. Again, this, the nationwide survey we did shows that alumni are interested in helping. I even see that at my alma mater, uh, that the alumni board is really interested in this and other alums as well. Uh, so see if you can partner with admissions to just help get the word out uh, about the quality of a CSU education and, and the various campuses. Um, going back to the podcast for one minute. So on average, they have 130 listeners per podcast and overall they've had over 2,000 listeners. Uh, they do one podcast about every two weeks. So it's uh, it's pretty frequent, but again, it's new content that they can then leverage in their newsletters and in other ways. And tomorrow I'll share one of their newsletters, uh, which I think has one of the podcast stories in it. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about Murray State uh, tomorrow. Those were the main things that I wanted to talk about as it relates to uh, potentially growing engagement. So um, Hopefully uh, I was able to highlight some ways for you to do that, whether it's through uh, your existing site and pages and thinking about the language that you're using, the images that you're using, all the way to uh, using different aspects of the Encompass platform that you might not be using as heavily, and uh, some of the ways that you can um, leverage the platform to make your lives easier, i.e. news listings and, and uh, elements like that. Questions, comments, thoughts from anyone? Sam, you raised your own hand. Yeah, I did. <laughs> As, um, someone who's is a, kind of a layman to the tool, um, any tips for kind of keeping track of all those news feeds? Is there kind of a, a, a data management question? I guess it's more what this is to kind of just help that keep organized on the back end for folks and understand, you know, what feeds are being connected to what pages, um, just in case someone has to, you know, do some archive digging on, on, a, on a page that they may have inherited? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a perfect answer for that. And I may have Jen talk about this if she's talking about news listings during her presentation. Uh, I do think it's it's a good idea on an at least annual basis to review the news listing types that are in the site. And sort of like what you saw with Oklahoma State, they went back and renamed some of them to the, the year um, that they were put in so that they were sort of um, it was clear that those shouldn't be used anymore. You can also delete them. Uh, it would remove any stories that are tied to them or stories wouldn't show up right with that filter anymore. But when we talked about cleaning up content uh, earlier, like what McMaster and Miami did, uh, it's worth going through pages and, and, and getting rid of old content. I would say the same is true for news listings. Uh, I do think it would need to be a separate document likely that your key encompass admin sort of just uses to track. These are the news listings that are for this thing. I'm not sure there's a, an easy way to pull it out of the platform and tie it to where, which news stories are tied to a news listing that I can think of right now. Brendan may have an idea there that I haven't thought of, but um, thanks for asking the hard questions, Sam. Yeah, and you know, one of those things, not everything necessarily has to be solved with the solution yeah. itself. Um, there's, you know, solid processes that teams could build out to, to stay on top of this stuff as well. And it's good to just know that those need to be in place. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? All right, 
then I think we can turn it over to Jen uh, to walk us through um, some of the things that SDSU is doing as it relates to engagement. So Jen, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I am Jen, I'm gonna share my screen really quick. And now hopefully you all can see my slides, increasing engagement with class notes. Now, before I begin, um, I'm Jen Ronaldo. I'm the Alumni Relations Specialist at um, San Diego State um, SDSU Alumni. And um, before, uh, before I start, I just want to say this is a brand new project that we are working on. So I don't have a lot of outcomes, but I'm really excited about what the potential this project has. Um, knowing that alumni, uh, human behavior in general, people love to talk about themselves. So uh, when we start kind of promoting it, we're really hoping to see some increased uh, engagement through our website. Um, so, oops, sorry, not clicking on the right screen. Um, so where we were, so um, the previous process that we had, our class notes had always been submitted directly to the SDSU magazine. Um, and that was the process before I started um, as a student here at SDSU alumni. So it had been a very long time. Um, the Depart uh, the University Relations and Development Marketing and Communications Office um, did the magazine. So since they're a part of our division, there was some collaboration um, between us and Marcom. And uh, soon after President De La Torre started, uh, she moved the marketing and communications to under the president's office, and it became the Office of Strategic Communications for the university. Um, so now it wasn't in our division anymore. So there was a little less collaboration between us and Stratcom. We still we still did work with them, but not as closely as we did when they were part of our division. Um, so. With that, the when class notes were submitted, we weren't copied on them. We didn't get them. We uh, tried to ask if we could get a copy, like if they were put in a spreadsheet or something, if we could get it. Uh, we couldn't. And uh, so we really were trying to look for a new way to, uh, to get these class notes and information on our alumni uh, that are going straight to the magazine but not coming to alumni. Also, information was lost. Nothing was getting updated into our Lucian CRM. Um, so we were losing that um, data on job promotions, on you know anything that we could put into the dat database. Um, so next. Uh, we started a redesign. So during the pandemic, we thought, well, great time to redesign our website. Um, so we started in 2001 and uh, we had some, the university wanted everybody to have a more consistent look and feel uh, with the flagship uh, website. So we kind of started rebranding our site and uh, did a complete redesign. Um, we had some staff turnover, so it took a little longer than we wanted it to. Um, but in that year, we had just, you know, kind of before we started the redesign, we had just submitted our first alumni engagement metric survey. Um, so we were really looking at the website as a way to increase engagement uh, through the lens of the alumni engagement metric survey. And um, so we started our, our first thing, which uh, we didn't touch on earlier with engagement was um, a birthday email. So that's what we started with. And we send it out every day to what we think are people's birthdays, at least that's what we have in our system, um, with a giveaway. And because uh, we want that click. So the click is the important part. So we would do a, a giveaway. We do SDSU alumni socks to 25 people a month. Um, so it, it's a, a kind of a low cost item, but it, it, was starting to increase engagement. So I was thinking, since we didn't get the class notes, it'd be great to add class notes um, to our um, to our website. And um, again, we had some st more staff turnover, and we didn't get to relaunch our site until twenty June end of June, twenty twenty two. So it was, it was quite the process. 
Um, but again, still having class notes on my mind, I put it on my later list. And I know we all have one of these. It's mine is on my whiteboard across from my desk. And it's those things that you want to get to later when you have some time. Um, you know it's important, but you just can't do it right now. So uh, class notes was added to my later list. And it's been sitting there since June of 2022 until now. Um, so we had even more staff turnover and an opportunity for something new. And uh, so fast forward eight months to where we are now. And we have our new executive director, Stephanie Dathy. Um, she wanted something to give to people that she saw wearing SDSU gear or SDSU alumni gear when she was out in the community and um, it needed a call to action. We also have a new magazine editor who was kind of learning the, the process for everything. And so we had a meeting with her last month and thought this is a great time to add class notes to our website. And this process, um, the old process was they would just email the magazine and then the magazine would have to go through all those emails and kind of pull them out and pull out what they wanted. Um, so we kind of talked about this new process and how this could work for all of us. And uh, she agreed that this was the best course of action. So uh, the class, class notes are off the later list and now they're on our website and soon to be um, put out to the public. So this is the page. Um, so the old page is the was is this kind of back one, our alumni spotlight. And the new page, it says alumni spotlight and class notes. Um, so I'm gonna go to it so I can just show you the live example of our page. Um, and it has so it has a text box here at the top with just some information. Um, these recent spotlights, these have been in either our e-news, in the magazine, on our news center, which is the, the university's news page, um, different profiles that we have. We show four, um, just to, so it's not huge. Um, and this also is a news listing. Um, so it's just the four most recent stories on alumni that we've had. Um, and you can view the archive and we open it in a new tab. And this is, is our old alumni profiles page. Um, so we do this, it is a news feed. Um, and uh, we do this as we set this up as an annual feed so we can do a, an archive. So every year we'll kind of switch out the news feed and um, you load more at the bottom and you can see down here, we have the archive. So these are all the pages that we've been keeping up with throughout the years. So these are um, all of the spotlights that have been in our e-news, like I said, uh, New Center, social media. Um, we kind of share them everywhere. The next are our buttons. We have two. So one is to submit a class note and one is to submit a note for someone else. Um, and I'll go into that for just a in just a minute. And then we only have six up because I've uploaded six. Um, so, and this is what we, these are some that we've gotten either through our alumni email or from the magazine email, I pulled them out of there. So we have a few that we have on here. So this is our new class notes page. I'm still kind of playing with it every once in a while. Sometimes I think these buttons should be closer to the top. Um, sometimes I like them down a little further above where all of the class notes are. I might add them two times on the page, I don't know, but that's kind of the beauty of websites um, that they you can make those changes when you, when you see something isn't working. So our submission forms. So we ended up, um, I know Mirko, you mentioned that the class notes were behind login. We at one point and during our homecoming tried to have an event uh, where we had people log in, lifetime members log in for so they could get free tickets. And it was chaos, absolute chaos, because we don't make people log in. People thought if they were logged into the app, that meant they were logged into the website. Um, and just, people had no, they could not figure it out. And it was, like I said, chaos. So we thought it best that there be no login for these forms. So we, I created two forms on our website 
One is for people to submit their own note. And one is so people can submit on behalf of somebody else. Because we get a lot of, my client wrote this book or so-and-so got a promotion at our company. Um, so that way we can, if it's if it's somebody not submitting on their, for themselves, they can upload a press release. So we have a, a file upload box on there. They can just put in their information, upload the press release, upload a photo if they have one, um, and then we get that information. Now, if it is, if they're submitting on for themselves, um, it's basically, a, it's, it's just a basic form. Um, you, there is an area they can submit a photo uh, if they want to include a photo. And then all of those get, um, they go, the admin emails come to, one comes to me because I want to see how many come in because I'm curious like that. They go to our uh, data integrity officer, um, receptionist, um, and she makes the updates in CRM. So that's this way we know now data is not getting lost. Um, and it, it also gets copied to the magazine email so they can see them as they come in. If there's somebody that they want to highlight or um, kind of do a bigger spotlight on since our class notes section in the magazine does have space for the like kind of smaller blurbs on the side, but then for kind of larger spotlights. So they can see them as they come in and see if it's somebody that it's worth kind of profiling a little deeper. Um, then when it's time to go to publication, I export all of the results, send them in a spreadsheet over to the magazine and, or will send them in over to the magazine. And they can use that to um, do their fact checking and editing for publication. Um, so I think that is having them all in one spreadsheet and being able to export them from the form uh, was really one of the reason, or one of the things that swayed the magazine editor. She was like, they can just be in, all in one spreadsheet and we don't have to do that. Um, and she got really excited. So I think the the ease of it um, really excited a lot of people. Um, when, and then depending on how quickly they come in, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, I'll just do an upload into the class notes section from the information that is contained on the form. Uh, we have we have them categorize the note. We have them kind of kind of do the steps like they were putting it in themselves, but I'll just put them in for them. Uh, we do use the forms with pre-populate user data link turned on and, of course, identity checkpoint because we want to make sure we get those ID numbers with the forms. Um, make it easier on us so we don't have to look, look them all up. Okay, and some of our marketing. Um, this photo in the back is our uh, just kind of the bottom of our e-news. So... Moving forward, the class notes will be featured. It'll be a regular feature in our e-news. And on those stories, we'll put a call to action. Do you have news to share? Submit a class note. So we're hoping that generates some, uh, some content. Uh, the sticker card. So as I mentioned earlier, Stephanie, our, our new executive director, wanted something to give to alum, alum she sees in um, SDSU or SDSU alumni gear. Uh, while she's out. So this kind of front image is our, um, it's our sticker card. So the front side of it is a sticker. It's just our logo, but it's a sticker. And then it's business card sized. And the back is the call to action. So this, the QR code goes to our class notes page. So we're, we're handing these out to people we see out into the community. Um, our plan, uh, Going back to AEM, um, we're looking to utilize our board of advisors and other volunteers to amplify this message. So later today, we do have a board meeting and we're doing a whole presentation on AEM and how it, why it's important for them to share our message to their networks. Um, and this being one of the, the messages. So we really want them to go out to their friends, family, coworkers, uh, because there's so many people in San Diego that are SDSU alumni, and we, we wanna hear from them. We wanna know what they're doing. Um, so we're hoping that our, um, our, our board can help publicize the message as well. And again, social media has been big for this too. Before we kind of started this, so you can see the class notes section that and that photo that is in there. Um, so 
it was a user generated story, although Caitlin does work in our office. So it was a little easy to get that one. Um, but uh, so we did a, um, a Valentine's Day story of Aztec couples. And um, so when we kind of put out there that, hey, we're looking for Aztec couples, Caitlin was like, I won. Um, so and, and we got a few others. Uh, that came in. So asking for photos, asking for people to talk about themselves on social media so far has been pretty successful. So we're hoping that that um, translates into um, a successful class notes project. And again, I don't really have much, uh, I don't have outcomes to share uh, since this is brand new, but uh, we're very excited to be launching this right now. Um, so that's kind of the project and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and if anybody has any questions. Here. I'm gonna stop share so I can see everybody. Okay. Not a question, but just kudos on um, finding efficiencies there and what is an, an outdated process, uh, creating better uh, connections with your communications team. Um, and I love the idea of like the, the staff being armed with like a little something that they could give alumni that they find in the wild. Um, so uh, just kudos, I hope that hope everything goes well. Yeah, we're, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times this weekend. So la uh, Wednesday through Saturday, we were in Las Vegas for the Mountain West Basketball Championship, um, and uh, which is why I wasn't at the Alumni Council meeting. Uh, but uh, so many people, and uh, so we all knew that everyone going to the game, there were going to be so many fans there. And there were so many that we just hadn't engaged with before, uh, which was so, so nice to see. But, and even at the airport, we were, um, met somebody at the airport and was like, oh, I went to SDSU and like, but wasn't at the game. So like having those cards, I think will be, will be really nice. Just a way to like, say like, oh, alumni, we're here for you. Um, so those would have been good to have over the weekend, but uh, they're coming soon. A good idea can't come fast enough, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I look forward to, uh, if anybody is curious about outcomes, when we start like trying to roll this out to people, I'm happy to connect with anybody if you want to talk further. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Sorry, I don't have the agenda up, so I didn't know how to throw it to you. No, you're totally fine. Um, okay. I was blanking on it too, but I, I think we're actually up for a break. Uh, so um, Sam, I think 1025 will give you all a chance to grab some coffee. And um, I think next we have Heather Andring. I see Heather trying to adjust her video and having some issues with the video, it looks like. Um, so you may not be able to see Heather, but Heather, hopefully we can hear you. But just a reminder, Heather, Heather is our director of um, product management over the advancement solutions. So Heather, um, I'm thinking we can hear you. Maybe. Wonderful. Can I confirm? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. I apologize for the video. I am even trying an external camera. So, um, but excited to be with you today. My name is Heather Andring, and I serve as the director of product management for our advancement solutions area. So I work directly with Encompass as well as our Ray's CRM product. Um, it was a privilege to be with you last year, and I'm really excited to be back and join you again this year. Um, most of my experience has come from being in your shoes, and uh, we were a longtime Encompass client at the campuses that I've worked at, and so um, excited to bring that into product management today and what the future of Encompass is going to look like. I served as the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Carnegie Mellon, and then most recently, prior to joining Anthology, just over a year ago, um, served as the Director of Advancement Services at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. So very excited to be with all of you today. 
Um, we have two other product managers, Joel Valentine and Jason Knoll, and I believe you'll be able to hear from both of them in the coming days. Um, and they each work with specific areas of Encompass. So what I'm going to do as we talk about the product update is really to walk through where we have uh, set the vision for fiscal year 23, what we've achieved today and what we have coming up, as well as then looking ahead to our planning and where we see ourselves going for fiscal year 24 and how you can be engaged in that process. So with all product um, conversations, we do tend to lead with a forward-looking statement. And just a caveat that what I'll share today is really our best picture of where we see our plans shaping for Encompass. Just like your work on campus, um, we need to be reactive to anything that emerges and sometimes priorities or timelines may shift. But what I'll talk with you about today is the best picture that we have of the plans that we have in work for um, future development for Encompass. So I wanted to start today by taking a look at the roadmap priorities that we shaped for Encompass. This was shared at Anthology Together last July and then again in our webinars that we presented um, early fall. So our focus was really to focus on the stability, accessib accessibility, uh, security and privacy of Encompass. So we really wanted to make sure Encompass foundationally was working in the ways that you anticipated it to be in a very reliable fashion. We also were excited about what we were going to do with the e-communication tools, um, focusing on some forward development with our giving teams with um, some philanthropic success initiatives. Um, we are taking and are continuing to take a look at how Encompass integrates with other products. Um, we understand the admin experience and lay and the needs there, and we really wanted to lay that out as more of a two-year process, with this year being a lot more of the behind the scenes and foundational work in order to be able to bring that into action in next year. Um, taking a look at how we can improve some analytics and insights and then also a focus on that client experience. So if we take a look at what we've achieved with the, what we've been able to deliver thus far, again, a lot of that focus was on product stability. And I really hope that you're seeing that in your day-to-day -day use. So we've enhanced our logging, monitoring, and early alerts so that we can address and understand any issues that may present very proactively. Um, we increased the capacity during some of our peak season activities, things like calendar year-end giving initiatives um, during Giving Tuesday in order to ensure there was seamless performance. Um, as you look at release notes, I think you'll have seen that there's a notable release in any product defects, and that's a trend we're going to continue to prioritize. Um, and really, we've introduced those logging and support tickets. And as we take a reflection on that, we are seeing that product performance has been enhanced. And so um, proud of that work. And it's something that you need in your, your work and the experience that your constituents are having every day with Encompass. Um, related to client engagement and voice. Um, I believe that you've already heard a little bit more about the client community and the idea exchange. And so those are two aspects that we're really excited about in order to facilitate uh, the client voice and experience. Um, certainly working closely with Nicole and other um, others who may visit your campuses and have engagements with you such as this. And we're very proactively trying to engage with clients as we shape roadmap and get your feedback into that. Um, and there have also been a couple of surveys, and I really appreciate those of you who've responded to a recent survey about um, anthology and overall sort of thoughts there, but look forward to future surveys so that we can gather additional feedback from you as clients into Encompass. Um, and then some specific features that we've uh, been able to deliver. We were able to deliver the multi-select feature and the token enhancements, uh, the status progress report indicator, uh, report pagination, both the ability to restore deleted as well as um, any hard deletes being able to restore them. Um, 
we are starting some UI improvements and uh, saw some changes to the admin dashboard. And with our most recent release last week, the ability to toggle back and forth amongst those new and older views, and then the Google Analytics for updates. As we look ahead, some of the work are related to MasterCard um, enhancements. We did just wanna make a note of the, that functionality that was delivered. Given uh, the guidance that MasterCard had put out, we did make some changes related to Encompass. Eventually for nonprofits, they did move that deadline out for us, but we already had that work prioritized and in motion. So we've moved ahead with that in order to assure that you're ready for that. Uh, with that, we were able to ensure that the scheduled email notification was no longer going to be optional, as well as then the perpetual gift cancellation being available in the member profile. Right here, what are the opportunities that you can make on campus? And really, that's being sure to review your, for, your forms and ensure that recurring and scheduled forms have those instructions on how to cancel scheduled payments. This was a change made by MasterCard really to be donor centric and to um, you know, ensure the experience of the card holder. And so we wanted to make sure the product was aligned and ready for you to be able to act on that updated guidance. So as we look ahead to some of our upcoming work here, some of this is already in motion and in some cases already completed, but we also wanted to look ahead to some work that we still have planned and are initiating as we move ahead through the end of the fiscal year here. So right now we're anticipating this work to be delivered by the end of July. That being said, sometimes timelines may uh, shift that out a little bit depending on any emergent um, priorities and or the timeline in order to complete the work. Um, but we do have work in motion for a payment gateway aggregator. This is largely going to be seamless and not visible to you as clients, but I do think it's helpful for you to be aware of it and that we've um, found a way to be able to um, make the updates that we need to make to our many payment gateways that are utilized amongst our institutions a little more seamless. What this will ultimately do from an Encompass perspective is allow us to update more seamlessly and add efficiency to the updating process, thereby enhancing the capacity so that we can move ahead with other um, payment gateway or forms updates in a different, different way. Um, the email editor updates. You'll hear more from Joel tomorrow related to this, but this is what I'm particularly excited about with the Encompass um, updates that we're bringing to you this year. Um, Joel's going to be with you again tomorrow, but this is really bringing a more modern interface and update to the email editor. Um, we're really excited about the feedback that we're giving, we're getting from clients. We still welcome your feedback. Right now, we're going to be bring, bringing you an on par update, but this also lays the found, foundation and groundwork for future enhancements. So look for more um, exciting opportunities there, including the opportunity to introduce variable content into your emails, which I think everyone will look forward to. Um, both accessibility as well as ongoing work related to security enhancements are always going to continue to be a part of our commitment. That's something that we do have in the works. I did want to note for you that we did just complete a third party audit related to accessibility and are going to be moving um, ahead and prioritizing um, the work related to that for both you and our constituents. We continue to address um, constituent facing forms first, and then we'll address the admin experience to follow. Um, we are also re on that related note going through the state ramp and related Texas ramp process related to security uh, certifications. So a lot of work and commitment from our team on that front. Really excited about the UI enhancements. Again, this is part of more of a two year longer range process that we're looking at. But we do understand that we really want to improve the look and feel of your experience with Encompass. Um, to that end, we did add a new position to our Encompass team focused specifically on Encompass UI experience. So Kyle Lundy has joined our team. He's dedicated solely to Encompass. Um, it's a new position, but Kyle is very familiar and has a design background related to the Encompass team. Um, so we're really excited about having this additional focus on the UI experience, and he'll work closely 
both with these enhancements as well as then accessibility and other related items. Um, related to that, we're looking at both what can be short-term wins, and you'll start to see some of that um, in the short term as how can we provide immediate wins to you as the clients, but also look at what is our longer range plan and look for opportunities uh, for ways in which you can continue to engage and provide feedback into the client experience as we um, get deeper into that planning. And then we have a number of features that we're excited to be working on or have planned to work on here. And that includes uh, facilitating the non-member to non-member merge process. Uh, we wanna bring some additional enhancements to email reporting, um, looking at a, an enhancement to be able to address event capacity limits. Sometimes those are over sell um, and have an ability to adjust the event capacity in a different way. Um, we are very close to re-enabling Venmo as a payment gateway option. And then many clients are also asking for the ability to facilitate recovering credit card transaction fees, whether that is on um, a philanthropic donation or an event form. And so we're looking at opportunities to be able to allow you to make that decision on campus and recover that as part of the donor experience, allowing um, your constituents to either cover on a fee basis or percentage basis what the credit card fee is. So those are some of the um, pieces that we have planned here through this spring. And then as we look ahead to planning for fiscal year 24, the roadmap is really an iterative process. We can constantly review it, reprioritize our work, um, but we are in a very concentrated effort right now where we'll be planning the roadmap that we'll be presenting at Together 2023 here in Nashville in July. Um, and that will really lay out the plan for our work from this July through next June. And we'd really like to invite your voice to be a part of that. Uh, so the idea exchange is the best way to be able to submit your ideas. However, I always appreciate the opportunity for you to reach out to myself or Jason or Joel, and we'll be really happy to field your ideas, get your feedback. Um, but this is a great opportunity for you to be able to include what you feel the ideas and needs are related to your campus so that we can prior prioritize those accordingly as we're laying our plans for fiscal year 24. So with that, um, a quick note on our prioritization, like how do we arrive at what um, the roadmap looks like. And with that, there are a number of factors. First and foremost, we always focus on the user feedback. So getting ideas from the ex idea exchange uh, focus groups, we're going to be having more of those related to the UI experience. Um, we take a look at our support tickets and defects, as well as surveys, and we look at competitive um, intelligence as well. What are competitors doing? in this market, what are the needs and problems that our clients have and how do we solve those for them? Um, we also need to be responsive to any of those regulatory and legal considerations, things like the security needs, um, data privacy, state ramp. Um, so those are certainly factors. And then how do we align that? And really this gets to at the prioritization of what features, enhancements and needs do we have and in what order do we need to address them on which timeline? So how does the idea um, exchange work? And really, this is an opportunity for you to submit your ideas. Um, it also allows an opportunity for clients to vote or upvote ideas. And that gives us a really nice uh, feel for the breadth of demand for that particular feature. Uh, you can comment on others' ideas and add additional use cases or scenarios to help us clarify what the, the need for it is. What I really about like about the idea exchange that we haven't had previously is that it allows the oppor opportunity for product managers to directly interact with you as the client submitting these ideas. So we do have a commitment to reviewing those ideas on no later than a weekly basis. We respond, we ask questions, um, we may slate it for roadmap consideration. Um, and then once that is actually slated for work, 
and it gives you an opportunity to have that visibility into the work and when it's going to be delivered. And to date, we are getting um, a lot of feedback into the IIDA exchange. Um, many ideas have already been submitted and we are actively slating those for planned work. And then Heather, just to quickly add to that, just on the bottom of your screen, you see we've already implemented a few things that came from the IDEA exchange uh, in terms of uh, the email functionality. And then there are a couple of others that uh, the team currently expects to complete before Anthology Together 2023. So I think this lines up really well with what Heather was sharing about if you submit things in the IDEA exchange, not only does our team look at it very quickly, but it also does start feeding into the roadmap and the prioritization. So definitely take uh, the opportunity to do that. Heather, you have a couple of questions or comments in the chat. If you don't mind just responding in the chat to those, I think that would be great. If there are other questions for Heather, please um, uh, put those in the chat also, uh, and we'll continue to, to respond that way, just keeping an eye on time. Uh, now, uh, I'm thrilled to have Corrine join us from Fresno State University, and I believe Corrine's going to talk about an interesting way to use the event tool uh, to do something giving related. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to share my screen really quick. All right, can everyone see my screen? Can everyone, can everyone hear me? Yep, let's go. All, okay. All right, okay, awesome. So hi, so my name is Corrine, and today I will be talking about GradFest. Um, and I, will, I want to talk about GradFest as a whole because our senior giving program actually reps into this entire event. So just a really quick background on who we are here at the engagement team and alumni association. So we are a two person team. Um, it's myself and my coworker Nicole, and we manage up to 17 chapters and clubs. We um, organize up to six major signature events a year. We also manage our volunteer program and our, also our events collaboration program. So, and our goal, because we are only a two person team, is to really streamline and increase our efficiency while working with the current resources and limited bandwidth. So as we move forward with this presentation, I just want everyone to keep in mind that we are not a big team, um, kind of we barely start re really truly diving in into Anthology and Compass barely a year ago. So it's still really a ongoing learning process. We are trying to constantly improve ourselves with what resources that we can get. So really quickly, this is kind of like a snapshot of um, like a mood board of what GradFest is. These are the merchandise that we sell that comes with our grad box. It does come with a cap, gown, and tassel and students as part of senior giving program. Over here, you can see if they donate a minimum of $25, they get uh, a student donor sash that they can wear. So just really quickly on what GradFest is, um, we actually, got the bronze award for a case in 2020 uh, under the category special events, events on a shoestring. That was kind of when COVID hit really quickly and we had to pivot five, six times within 24 hours to figure out how to get all our graduates their grad boxes. Um, um, grad Fest is a great volunteer opportunity. It's a four day volunteer event uh, where we built 2,800 grad boxes. Each year we uh, welcome about 50 volunteers, majority of them are alumni and campus staff. Grad Fest itself is a three day pickup for students to get their grad boxes. We hold it intentionally at the Smith Camp Alumni House because this is their first welcome first step into becoming an alumni. And it's to have that physical setting for them makes a great impact. We invite um, our grad coordinators to table the event if they're interested in. And we also kind of tell students what other uh, vendors are and resources are available to them as they move towards graduation. So really quickly, I'm gonna show you a quick video on how it was last year. And let me know if you can't hear the music. Oops.
Okay, so yeah, that's kind of how it is that we do grad fest. And then just to point out, this year we kind of actually change up our marketing strategy a little bit, and obviously we use Anthology and Compass for it. Um, on a first day sales, we have had our highest sales in history, and also our one week sales, we've hit our highest record in history. So we are actually very, very excited for that. In terms of senior giving, uh, we saw a pretty decent dip in 2022. So my coworker and I were like, well, what other things we can do to kind of bring up the numbers back up. So it's still lower than 2021, but it's doing a lot better than last year. So we will take that as a win too. So in terms of marketing, we have our website that we house under Omni CMS. We obviously do a multi-pronged approach with email and social media on Facebook and Instagram. We promote it on our official alumni association Instagram um, accounts and also on our live mascot program account. In terms of email and the pre-order site, these main these two things are probably our biggest asset and we utilize Encompass for it. So for email, we sent a total of seven promotional emails, excluding one countdown email and including two of the senior giving focus email. Uh, we do segmentations. Uh, we do one with the incomplete member data records email that we get. So we kind of collect that in an Excel spreadsheet and we send out to students, hey, we saw you started a form, but you, did you, uh, you didn't finish. This is a friendly reminder. And we also do encourage uh, senior giving we send a segmented email out to students who purchased a bot but did not donate yet. In terms of the pre-order side, um, for the first time, very excitedly, we started role basing to make sure we uh, students don't miss any fields they need to fill up. So if they choose undergraduate, graduate or senior giving, it will take them to like a uh, different questions in different pages. And obviously we use HTML templates and CSS styling to really elevate our look this year. So this is kind of how the different kind of emails we do. We uh, incorporate GIFs, videos, images, um, different, different ways, very visual for to really capture the student's attention and different ways with each different email. So it kind of like mix things up a bit. It's not the same consistent feel to it. So this is what I'm going to show you a before and after difference. This is what you're going to see is what happened in 2022 with a pre-order site. It's very, very long, incredibly long. There's a clutter of information. And because we want students to be able to donate without purchasing the grad box and we didn't roll base, we were unable to make the fields where students purchase the box and put in their t-shirt size a required field, which caused a lot of complications like a lot of back and forth with the students because they thought they bought a box but they actually didn't or they bought a box but never put a size in and we're running out of sizes and by the time they pick up their box we don't have the size they needed left so it was a whole thing so this is basically the cover page for our event which you can see we definitely did not use and starting from here to here to here and to here, they're all in one page. A lot of scrolling, a lot of information for students to go through when you want really our goal is to make things as easy as possible. And this was our confirmation email. There's, it's just really basic, I would say. So after attending the conference last year for the first time, um, we managed to add some magic dust to our events module. So we, as I say, we utilize role basing, HTML customization, and CSS styling. So this is basically what our cover event page looks like right now. So it's all the necessary information that students need to know. And then from there, they can decide do they really want to purchase a box or no. If they do, then we're going to go to a very straightforward form. So before I show you that, I want to talk about how we role base. So there's basically three uh, options we give students. They can purchase an undergraduate box, a graduate box, or if they're not interested and they just want to donate, they can choose the senior giving option. If they choose the undergraduate or graduate box, they bring them to their pre-order uh, page, which will ensure that they're actually paying for the right box, they're paying for it, and they're actually selecting their size. And all of them, regardless of which flow you go, will bring them to the senior giving page. 
So this is basically the first step, which is they get to choose their three options. And then depending, they choose undergraduate or graduate, it will bring them to two different um, page. And then you can see now we can actually require the fields, which for this year has really mit mitigate and helped with all the back and forth going on and errors with students uh, orders. And then this is our um, information on senior giving. We try to make sure that all the information on where um, the three different funds they get to choose from are, how it impacts students, transparency on last year's result. We also set a minimum of $1 donation because in the past we keep getting like a penny donations because some students think they still have to donate even though they don't want to. So to be able to round it up really helps with um, reconciling on the back end. And then we also created a simple form on the site to collect donor data for students who are interested of actually donating during GradFest itself. And then moving forward, we are planning to do like a post grad fest segmentation target to student donors to congratulate and welcome them to the alumni family to thank them for being student donors. And of course, to announce our fundraising results, how many, like how many total donors from the class of 2023, how much was raised and really the breakdown of each fund. And this is our confirmation email right now using the a free template of HTML customization that Anthology provides. You can see here now is a lot more branded with our colors. We get to add pictures and everything just looks a little bit more put together. And my favorite really is the ability for students to actually update their information on their own in their registration, the button right here that comes with it. Because sometimes students realize that they put in the wrong student ID or they put in the wrong email or they want to change up their sizes. This is something they all can do on their own right now instead of them having to come to us and us have, having to do it on their back end. And just a quick plug, uh, this is another great thing that we do under Anthology is that we have our listing pages, one for <clears throat> all the different events happening on campus. And another one, this is a big win for us, is to be able to do every single commencement registration through Anthology and to be able to list it all in one page. So really a one-stop shop. And this enables us to collect all our students' information data, which we know is super important, and also to be able to make sure that we are collecting the information necessary for our photography vendor as well. So this whole thing, this is our first year doing it, and it's been a big win for our team. So that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I think we're good. Doreen, so did gonna, you get any yes. feedback from students directly in terms of, in, in well, I, I guess the, sometimes the absence of some of these questions and updates is, is indication enough that it was success, but uh, anything in particular from students that um, in terms of the process for signing up for the boxes or the class gift? I think honestly, um, not hearing from students is the clearest indication that we are doing things well, because in the past it was constantly having to email students, hey, you didn't put in your t-shirt size, or hey, it's you went through the whole form, but you didn't actually buy a box. And then it's just that back end students coming back to us like, oh, I put in my wrong uh, student ID number and stuff. So to not hear from them is, mute, is the silent music to my ears. Mm. Awesome, thanks. I mean, I really appreciate that, especially the magic dust. I'm with Mirko. Uh, that's a <laughs> really big win there to be able to kind of sprinkle in um, all those different touches across your, your site that is there. So um, with that, as we start to move into the next section here, for those of you that um, I do not know or haven't met yet, um, I'm Brendan Woodworth and I um, work and serve as our manager of adoption and client enablement here at Anthology. Um, so I'm happy to kind of jump through here today. Um, a lot of these different engaging events, tips, tricks, examples, et cetera, to really start to, to piggyback off of Kareem, add more magic dust uh, along the way into your, your own sites that are there. So with that, the first example, if we start to dive into this a little bit further, um, is going to actually not be a, an event, if you will. Um, and it's going to be coming from our Murray State friends. Um, so 
In this non-event example, um, it's a great example of taking the opportunity to say, what is the technology that we have at our fingertips and at our disposal, um, and breaking it down to the core attributes. You know, what are those various features like the ability to add a guest or you know, attendee lists, confirmation emails, the reporting that's centered around these different you know, technological components, and how do we repurpose that for the various programs and thinking outside of the box. So in this case that we're looking at for raising racers, um, it's all about Murray State's legacy program and being able to collect family information about those you know, legacy children that are out there. So I'm looking at some of uh, our friends and colleagues here. San Bernardino also has a really great legacy program out there. Um, but this is a way to collect that information in a way that helps promote um, data hygiene and better reporting. So instead of running all this information data collection through a traditional form, they're leveraging an event registration form. And what this allows them to do is leverage the guest step to be able to add in each one of those guests as a student. Um, and what this allows for on the reporting side of the house is an individual row for every single one of these um, children that they start to incorporate uh, as part of that registration process. Um, now, on the reporting side of the house, this becomes really important um, because everything is in clean rows, as opposed to looking at individual columns and needing to um, be an Excel wizard to be able to pull that information back and, and do something with it. So just a, a quick highlight there. Um, as they transitioned and, and keeping this experience into the event registration form. Um, from a stat-wise perspective, they had 622 families registered online overall. Um, and of those 600 families, uh, there was about 1,200 legacy children registered as, as part of those guest registrations that are there. It's heavily promoted through their newsletter and any of those email communications that go out. Um, and since they launched this last fall in 2021, they had to slow down the promotions of all of this information because it was such a hit and it took off. They needed time to kind of catch up on it. So as you start to think about, you know, introducing those legacy programs or revamping what you have out there, start to think about some of those other technological components that you have that may lend itself uh, useful like we did here with the event module. Now, if we start to take a look uh, at the next example, this one's coming from Grove City College, and it's important to kind of take a high level look here because, you know, events are events are events. But what we're looking at here and a lot of the examples that we're, you know, showcasing today is going to be what makes it the experience. What are those small touches that you can start to add to your event registration forms, uh, promotion items, landing pages, et cetera, that really start to make this a, a robust experience. And it's all those tiny touches that are there. Um, so as we're looking at this example from Grove City, um, it's no, I'm gonna say the words, uh, it's no secret. This has been around for a while in terms of putting together some uh, alumni gathering boxes to be able to send out to your alumni in the area that may not necessarily always be able to come to your traditionally supported and put on programs. Um, but in this case with Grove City College, um, they're encouraging their alumni to get together uh, and sign up and register for these alumni boxes. Uh, they're calling it uh, Grover Gatherings, um, where Alumni will fill out a form to request one of these boxes. Um, anywhere there is individuals between four or five, up to 20 different people that they, they start to host there. Uh, and Grove City College will start to supply superior, uh, supply materials such as name tags, balloons. Um, there's a, a GCC trivia game that's there as well as some of the college swag. Um, so as we start to look at this, uh, I really like the example that we're pulling here from them because some of those tiny touches that we're looking at is that landing page with those big visual cards in the middle, um, looking at the way that the box is designed over on the right hand side, again, thinking about those small touches and details. And finally, on the left hand side of the screen in this example here, um, it's a promotion that they put in their alumni magazine. So this one came from their, their January 2023 uh, alumni magazine highlight there. The next example here comes from the US Coast Guard Academy. Um, and this is a great example of being able to add activities for their youngest alumni classes that happen to be graduating. So we all think about it. We have various cohorts in our alumni population that are uh, underrepresented um, or don't necessarily show up to a lot of the events and programming that you all put on and, and take place. So 
for the Coast Guard Academy, this unengaged group of alumni happens to be their youngest classes. Um, so they wanted to figure out a way to incorporate them without necessarily expanding their, their resources um, to, to cover this, this group. Um, so it centered around homecoming. Um, and what they ended up doing with their homecoming schedule over the last uh, two years is allow for these most recent graduating classes to be able to come back and register for homecoming um, as part of their alumni tailgating reception. Now inside the tailgating tent as part of that registration and, and the event that's taking place, there is a special area set up for the fifth, the 10th and the 15th year classes that are there. They were highlighted in in the registration form. So that way um, they feel like they're welcome to come back and they, they feel that inclusion as they register as part of the, the overall homecoming tailgate. But really it's just kind of mixed into the overall programming of that tailgating event with a few small personalized touches such as those specialized areas for the, the various classes that are there. So as they start to think about other cohorts um, and bringing back um, some so more inclusive touches inside of their, their larger event weekends, such as homecoming. Um, they're really starting to look forward to more family friendly um, activities and planning to include a, a bounce house and similar areas to cater towards uh, not only the families that are coming back, but also some of those most recent graduating class years that also happen to be families um, that coincide there. So a nice way of starting to look at those various demographics that, that may be under attending some of those different events and, and being able to still identify and highlight some, some opportunities that are there. Now, if we start to go to the, the Southwest area of the country, uh, this example comes from Northern Arizona. Um, and at Northern Ar Arizona, wow, I'm losing my words here for a second. Um, but at Northern Arizona, connecting alumni with current students continues to to be a focus for the alumni engagement team. So the team regularly hosts Alumni Thrive Mixers, that's the name of their program. Uh, often it's focusing in on the Phoenix area, which is where their most concentrated alumni population happens to be. But they also look to host a lot of these other mixers around the country as well. So they've also rolled up externship opportunities, grant programs, opportunities to connect alumni with um, other students um, and into the Lumberjack Thrive program. All of this kind of rolls up underneath that Alumni Thrive Mixers um, programming that is there. So it allows for a broader umbrella for marketing purposes to be able to, to get out there um, and really stake a claim around a lot of these uh, initiatives that are taking place um, from an alumni perspective connecting students. So the team here uh, is building a culture of support uh, with those current students. And so far it's seen uh, the most success with the Thrive Mixers with over 500 attendees uh, at seven different events over the past three years. Um, but this also has helped um, 34 students with externship opportunities with alumni. And it's also had alumni volunteers. Uh, it's also allowed alumni volunteers there to become mentors uh, as part of a, a structured engagement opportunity. So a, a nice, way of kind of pulling that together and, and taking a look of all these other linked programs and bringing it into you know one larger umbrella that sits there as well. Now, as we move forward, uh, hopefully I don't scare too many here on the left-hand side, um, but if your detail pages um, happen to look like this, um, be scared, be very, very scared in that sense of the word. It doesn't have to look uh, like a little house of horrors over on the left-hand side uh, when it comes to those detail pages that hold the registration button and the traditional attendee list uh, button as well. So on the right-hand side, this example comes from, from Vassar, um, and this is a way to reconfigure it and look at the use of those detail pages that automatically get spun up. What are those opportunities to, you know, put those finishing touches to make it a great user experience in terms of highlighting the information that alumni are looking for most. So the registration, the attendee list button, you know, the time, date, and location, they're starting to include that over on the right-hand side there. Now, what I like most about Vassar here is that they're taking this as an opportunity to say, all right, those folks that are getting the details about this event, either through snail mail, um, if they're browsing your website organically or being pushed here from an email marketing uh, solicitation, this is where folks decide to either make or break the event, uh, whether they're 
coming or not. Um, so what they decide to do here as part of the detail page is start to include additional areas of engagement that someone might be interested in, in the event that they are not able to attend um, for any various reasons that are there. So think about other things that we can start to incorporate inside of these various detail pages um, that are there. So as we start to you know, look at these, because this was a great example that Vassar had put together from uh, a free per, or a paid for perspective with our design team. Free is my favorite word, uh, and I wanted to get to that very quickly there. Um, but this is some detail pages that you all have access to uh, that our design team has put together. And there's a link here to our support center site to be able to reinvent uh, and redesign stylize what that detail page happens to look like. So there's four different layouts. Um, this one happens to be option layout number one. There's a second layout option where we're color blocking uh, the important details that matter most to folks when they're looking at that detail page uh, up at the top of the page. Um, so I like this one. This is probably my favorite one out of the four. There is a third option here where we've now added a right-hand column, very similar to what we were looking at with Vassar, where the information is going to be housed over on that side, and then the, the more lengthy details going to be on the, the left. And then the fourth example here is going to be color blocking, as well as grouping everything in that right-hand column. Um, so different ways of pulling that together. Like I said, these are all available on our support center site. So that way you can kind of go in, copy the code and all the instructions. So that way you too can have uh, a stylized landing page uh, that is out there um, to really jazz things up a little bit. Now, if we start to look at uh, other examples, Corrine had a really great example there in terms of the event listings that were you know, taking place on, on her site. Um, this example um, shares that same pattern, um, and this comes from, from Knox College. Um, so as we start to think about different ways that we can start to engage with our constituents, um, this is a, a great opportunity to be super visual in that calendar listing of events that are taking place. So in this case, we're leveraging the checkerboard layout feature. So traditionally, when people are, are reading, um, we're most accustomed to that F reading pattern where folks start to scan left to right and then slowly make their way down um, the page. In this scenario here, what we're taking advantage of is someone's uh, checkerboard reading pattern. So being able to kind of scan back and forth and ping pong left and right as we move down a page, whether that be on our desktop or a mobile device. So in this case, we're having images you know, alternate left and right uh, with the, the details of the events uh, that are going to be on the, the opposite side there. So a great um, example in the wild of leveraging those uh, checkerboard layout features that we'll get to in a little bit here um, to be able to start to you know, implement. One of the other things that I like most about this page before we go on to the next example um, is going to be that upper header section. Um, thinking about other ways that we can start to encourage engagement. Um, what they include here, Knox does, um, is a li link to all of those past recordings and past events that are up there as well. So thinking about different ways that we can start to encourage that bouncing ball of, of alumni engagement on our sites. So this example from Nebraska, this is the Young Alumni Academy and it's in their 10th year. Um, and it has over 400 recent alumni participate in the program. So each year around 40 to 50 recent grads participate um, and they come back to campus once a month uh, and they get, be get a behind the scenes look uh, at what is going on throughout campus as they meet with different folks uh, as well as different locations, again, starting to kind of get that behind the scenes tour uh, of what goes on behind a university. So this has been probably one of Nebraska's most successful programs recently um, as they're able to kind of tap into that past cohort members for volunteer opportunities. They serve as ambassadors for other initiatives that they're promoting. Um, so really being able to use this uh, cohort, so those 400 participants over the last 10 years, to really dive into as some of their more engaged alumni to, to tap. So this group, um, they're also invited to those various baseball games, tailgates once a year to kind of keep them involved with the Alumni Association. And it's also a really great way to introduce those recent alumni to the world of advancement. 
um, and what is offered to them from an alumni engagement perspective without necessarily needing to ask them um, for a donation. Now, however, that being said, uh, Nebraska is a membership organization. So participants are asked to join the membership um, organization at some point during you know, their programming before the, the year is up uh, for those. But for them, there is an application process for this program, um, which is through an Encompass form, and emails are sent out to promote it. Um, as we're starting to look at um, this, alumni typically are targeted in that 200 mile radius of campus. Um, and they also start to include this in all alumni email newsletters as well as social media. So that way, if anyone wants to participate outside that um, 200 mile demographic, they're also uh, included uh, and encouraged to come back uh, for that as well. So as we're starting to look at next year, um, something the team is working on is going to be expanding that Young Alumni Academy and what that looks like. Um, and in, in its current form, it's going, it's in person, um, but they're looking to expand that onto an online version as well. So that way they can start to incorporate more folks outside of that, um, you know, 200 mile radius of campus. Now, moving right along, um, as we start to look at this, you know, partnering with other departments um, and their alumni uh, really starts to contribute to a stronger alumni engagement from an event perspective, as well as a philanthropic perspective, being able to take alumni relations and, you know, bridge that gap with our campus partners always becomes a, you know, a challenge, but also an opportunity for us to, to really, you know, make our mark and, and provide better programming for our alumni constituents. So at the Colorado School of Mines, the advancement team has worked closely with, in this case, the Petroleum Engineering Department, um, which recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. Now, the department, along with advancement, uh, organized a gala event to celebrate the centennial. Uh, it's included uh, an induction of 12 different honorees into the Petroleum Engineering Hall of Fame. And then the Hall of Fame was launched as part of you know, one of the celebrations. So over 100 people started to attend the gala. It raised um, just under $150,000 in direct gifts, as well as the state, the state commitments for the department. So thinking about different ways that we can kind of reach across the campus, um, shake hands and, and link arms, uh, this is a really great example of um, that with the engineering department at the Colorado School of Mines. For this next example, um, and we're, we're rapid fire here as we start to go through this, um, this one's from Syracuse. Um, and again, thinking about those little touches um, that kind of come through and, and ways that we can create an experience around those various examples. Um, this is a, a really nice one. Um, so this team here, had developed a new series of events to welcome the class of 2022 and help familiarize them with the alumni network as well as the areas where they were moving to because not everyone's gonna be staying in central New York. So starting in June, um, 15 locations across the country were hosting events for their most recent graduates to help introduce them to their city, give them a chance to meet with alumni, start building their alumni network. And all of these locations um, were you know, strategically pinpointed in those regions that had an active regional club or, or group uh, present. So this example here um, is from the LA chapter, um, and it was in, from mid-June and includes a, a morning hike to the, the Hollywood sign. So the events are easy to find on their website, as well as any of the given regional filters that, that SU has available. So if we're looking at that example over there on the, the left-hand side in that visual graphic, it's very easy to start to see what areas um, you know, of the country would I be interested in to start to familiarize myself with you know, where some of the programs are taking place. So instead of using text on a page, which no one ever is reading, 28% of the words on a page are, are actually read, they're starting to incorporate those visual graphics with highlighting the states for those various regions. So really start to like the, uh, the graphic nature when it comes to incorporating some of those different elements that are there. So if we take a look a little bit further here with you know, that one example that we're talking about with LA, we can start to see the landing page on the left-hand side as well as the registration form on the right-hand side. We can see these stylized, those various fields there, as well as some of the, the help text at the very top. Nice little finishing touches um, for the, the event registration form itself. 
Um, so as we start to go through this, you know, and, and take a look at all of those different pieces that are there, um, the first email that went out um, to kind of start to promote this happened to be in early May. It had a 54% open rate with a 5% click rate um, and 11, you know, 11 conversions uh, off of that one single email that, that had taken place there. The form is enabled for pre-population. So as you're sending out those email marketing messages, the ability to link the recipient to the account as they register so that someone is soft authenticated into the registration process um, is a, is a hand, hands down go-to for all of the various events that are there uh, and my recommendations. So being able to turn on pre-population for each of those different events is a, is a thumbs up pro tip for me. Um, but this is a great opportunity to start to, to kind of take a look at, at all those different pieces that are, are there. Finally, as we start to take a look at one of these last examples um, is going to come from Southern California with Occidental College, and they do a really great job at follow-up communications after an event takes place, both for the attendees, but also for those that were not able to come, but still happen to have registered there. So I know a lot of you um, start to incorporate some of those follow-up email communications to those attendees, but this is a really great way of starting to segment that communication um, and changing that first paragraph there to, you know, change the verbiage up a little bit to those that happen to have attended versus those that did not attend there. Um, at the bottom of each of the email reminders, um, it's very similar and it asks folks as a, a reminder to consider making a gift. Both the communications generally have a really high engagement um, statistic rating, both from an open rate, but also those click rates as well. So for an example, for looking at those non-attendees from a recent Miami event, they had a 51% open rate um, from those non-attendees um, as well as um, a, a high click to open rate there as well. On average, their open rate sits around 55%, just as a benchmark for folks uh, if we're looking at those. So as we start to move into, you know, some of those, how to apply, you know, some of those event tips and tricks, I've got a few up my sleeve to share with the group here. Um, and I'm going to use Oklahoma State again, we've heard a lot from them today, but um, one more example from them in terms of being able to put together an event registration form um, and leverage this on the admin side. So for those folks that are coming to your event and you're checking them in um, at the event table, what Oklahoma State does is they've added in a tab to the member profile with all those most frequently used fields. So that way, as someone's checking an individual in or chatting with someone at the event registration table, they can look the member up and start filling out and updating someone's record right there on the spot uh, with any of those details and information. So thinking about ways of you know, using an event and that check-in process to be able to you know, serve as a, an information intake or update process uh, as well. But speaking of event reminders uh, or event check-ins, there's a reminder of the event check-in app. Um, so anytime that you build an event inside of Encompass, uh, there's an automatic event check-in feature, um, that functionality. So that way on your, your mobile phone, your tablet, your desktop, um, you're able to automatically start to check in all of those various attendees quickly and easily for any of those different events that happen to be taking place outside of the region or on campus, et cetera. So gone are the days of all of those paper lists and tracking down um, all of those volunteers that happen to be sketching in names here and there. Being able to digitize all of these options um, is the, the way to go there as we start to go back into those in-person events. So Corrine was uh, gracious enough to, to mention there as part of her presentation, the confirmation email and being able to incorporate some of those design stylistic elements to you know, spice it up so it doesn't look like a, a traditional ransom note and starts to look a little bit more on brand and, and on key. Um, so we do offer up as part of our support center some free HTML. So as we're looking at here at the example, so that way you can take the HTML, copy paste it, and then make some quick, easy updates to the color, um, the logos, any of the imagery that sits there as well. And I've included here as part of the slide, some of those quick tips in terms of, you know, incorporating some tokens or mail merge fields into the confirmation email, um, as well as making sure that we continue that alumni engagement touch point with some various call to actions there as well. So a great resource to kind of take a look at um, a little bit later. 
We did take a look at Knox, um, as well as Corrine's example from Fresno State in terms of those various event listings. Um, so looking at that checkerboarded um, layout that we see over there on the, the right-hand side, there are two other layout options that are available to you all complementary. Uh, if we have that resource link um, out to our support center site, there's the wide layout with the image on the left where we're color blocking the date in the center. And then we have a more simplified layout with the color blocking on the left of the date and then an optional image over there on the right hand side. So quick, easy ways to start to freshen up any of those event listings that are there, similar to what Mirko was talking about earlier with those news listings as well. So for some quick additional tips, and we're going to rapid fire through here um, with some of these different ones, um, but start to think about that user experience on the registration form itself. It doesn't necessarily have to be super transactional. So in this case, what we're looking at here are all the various fields that you know someone could register with. Um, I think the one key takeaway is taking a closer look at that email entry box that people are starting to you know, fill out their email address in. By default, it's going to be an email text box confirmed so that people have to enter in their email you know, in twice. But I don't know about you, but um, I don't ever want to do that. Um, it's super frustrating to be able to enter an email uh, twice since I enter in it all the time and happen to know it. Um, so on the back end, as you're looking at that field, you can change the field type to be a regular email text box and remove the confirm option. It's a great way to bring back some of that um, user goodwill um, because most of the time we write email more than our last names, you know, autofill from any of the various browsers that we're leveraging. So um, shorten up the form and get rid of that email confirm box would be my recommendation there. Now we're also looking at um, stylized text. Um, so the fields on the left and those two various columns here. So I expanded the view here on our reunion registration form so you can see kind of how that looks as a, as a whole. Um, but this is leveraging that CSS that is there behind the scenes to be able to take those various categories and float the left or right side by side to again, get rid of that scroll fest that happens to you know, take place with a lot of those events that have you know, many fields that we want to collect good information on, but how do we do it in a way that, that makes sense to users? So I've included a link to our resource center here as well. So that way it has all the various CSS options that are available to you all um, to start to add in that magic dust um, to all the different events that are there. Inside of your event now, if we're thinking about gala events, if we're thinking about golf outing, sponsorships, et cetera, I did wanna make note that for all of your various events that there is the opportunity to start to include a cost as part of that ticket value. Um, it's leveraging our fair market value. And in doing that, you can start to set aside, you know, of the $500 that is there, X number of dollars are tax deductible um, and the fair market value is going to be the, the remaining dollars that are there. By leveraging that fair market value um, setting on any of those commerce fields, it starts to break out in your reports um, those two different dollar amounts for all of the different registrations and those items that happen to be purchased. So that way from the report, you can easily start to reconcile um, the dollars that are tax deductible versus those that happen to be a donation. So just wanted to highlight that there in terms of the fair market value and being able to incorporate some of those into the various events that might be taking place out there. One final tip that I've got for everyone is going to sit around appeal codes. Um, you know, so appeal codes typically work, you know, and appeal code equals or an appeal equals XYZ in the URL. And this is for any of those commerce related events that are taking place. But for those free events, this is where we're going to leverage a tokenized hidden value. Um, so if you haven't heard of a tokenized hidden value just yet, don't panic, don't worry. There's a, a total of page dedicated in the, the support center as a resource link there in terms of step-by-step -step instructions. But it's a really great way to put in the URL and source. So if we're looking at the, the setting here, it's whatever that token is um, that we're looking at. If I can get my, oops, just kidding. I was going to start to highlight there in the, the middle there, the, uh, the gosh, what am I looking at? The admin window. Um, but you can see that there's the token of source that is there. So in the URL now, at the end of your event details, we would then include the ampersand source equals followed by whatever value that you'd like to use as, as an appeal code. In this case, we're looking at homepage. 
Um, by doing this, we'll start to use that tokenized hidden value to, to populate that information there and allow you more granularity in terms of you know, marketing efforts and again, using those appeal codes for things. Last but not least, before I wrap it up, um, if you do happen to need any assistance, um, this is a really great example coming from the University of Iowa. Um, but in this case, um, they had a, I'm sorry, the Iowa State team, they're gonna kill me for making that mistake there. So among friends, don't ever tell them that I said that. Um, but for the friends here at Iowa State, um, they had some staff turnover. So they looked to our team to start to help build out um, any of their different events. We were, you know, staff augmentation, hands to keyboard, that consultative, you know, red phone to be able to, you know, help that through that transition period. So that way they didn't have to panic and, and just make a hire. They were able to kind of sift through all of those, you know, different applications uh, and take their time because they had the support behind the scenes there. So if you find yourself in that transition period, um, just feel free to reach out to Nicole for, for any of that, that help that might be there. Now, speaking of Nicole, um, for those that have not met Nicole uh, yet, she is your client experience manager, Nicole Velegi Sandage. So I'm, I'm gonna ask her to kind of pop on here for any of the, the wrap up that we might have as well before we, we end for this morning. And as Nicole pulls up her slide, I just wanna invite folks, if you do have a question, um, just add it to the chat. Um, since we're short on time, we're just gonna probably pick it up tomorrow first thing, um, but we definitely wanna hear if you have any thoughts or questions. So drop that into the chat, uh, just so that we can give Nicole a nice little feature and uh, end on a somewhat reasonable time. Thanks all. Well, hello everyone. It's so nice to see so many names and faces that I recognize. I hope you all are navigating the wicked weather that so many of you are experiencing right now. It's kind of crazy. I actually talked to four of you all uh, yesterday and I saw trees blown in the wind and people coming in with rain jackets. Um, so yeah, hopefully everyone is as well as can be um, given these very trying times weather-wise. But if you don't know me, as Brendan mentioned, I'm Nicole Velegi Sandage. I am your client experience manager, really your anthology advocate and that first point of contact um, for anything that you need. So um, if you don't have my contact information, I'll make sure to put it in the chat. But I have three quick slides for you. So we'll wrap this up really fast. I know I have two minutes. Thank you everyone for giving me two minutes to try to zip through this. Uh, and Nicole, sorry, there you go. Sorry to interrupt your screen share. It looked like we were looking at your, your calendar. Oh, my calendar. Hi, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> There's my calendar. Um, so for all of you, we have, um, so the first thing I want to mention is the Anthology Academy. So I know we've mentioned this quite a few times. We really try to push this out. This is our main form of training um, for you all. So if you can just do a quick heart in the chat, if you currently use Anthology Academy, that would be fantastic. Um, but I just wanted to give you a very quick overview of how to navigate. I know some folks have said um, it's just really difficult to find the Encompass information, uh, but the, the URL is at the top, so if somebody could post that in the chat, that would be great. If you haven't already, I can't see the chat at the moment. Um, if you click on your Encompass tile, sometimes people will go in here and say, oh my gosh, there's only three things available to me. Um, in fact, if you click on that top um, navigation bar up here, you'll see there's a long list of different sections of trainings. One in particular that we, we're going to highlight right now because it's not in alpha order is uh, the Inspire Live section. There is, I mean, there's a ton of great information throughout the Encompass tile, but in particular, um, I'm just going to point out the Inspire Lives. Um, and as you can see, Essential is the subscription level that everybody has with their accounts. So you all have access to these recordings, um, about 34 minutes to 45 minutes to 60 minutes long, incredible um, content here. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, um, there was a great session with Joel Valentine from our product development team with the email editor changes that are happening next month. Highly encourage you to check that one out. And later this month, there'll be another in, um, Inspire Live on event reporting. So um, keep that in mind. So that is your very quick Academy overview. We have three levels of subscription. So there's the, uh, the Essential Enhance and Enhance Plus. And I'm gonna share more details on that another time when we have more time. The other uh, resource that I wanna share with you and make sure everybody is aware of is, and I can't get up there to click my tab at the top here. Oh, not my calendar. 
Nicole, it looks like the community is your second tab. That's right behind. I know right it's right. One. It's right behind the navigation at the top, and I can't move the navigation. Um, I just dropped the link in the chat for everyone. So if you okay. can go to the chat, Nicole, you might be able to grab it from there Thank as you. well. All right, let's. Oh, there. Now I can get. Oh, tip for anyone presenting: are. the control tab also allows you to move in your browser from tab to tab. So <laughs> it's not just Encompass knowledge that we dropped today. It's, it's the, all things, the things we learn here, friends. <laughs> the things we learn. Okay, cool. So you can also <laughs> drag your Zoom menu too, um, so if, if it's in the way there. I, I think I got it now. Okay. I think, I think, too I think too much. Good. Too many tips now. Sorry. I know. I know. Tell me. Tell me. Hopefully, you all can see my screen. In any case. Here is the community page. Hopefully somebody posted that link in the chat as well. Maybe another heart if you um, are using this community page. But basically, once you go into the link, you just need to um, request access. Uh, access is typically provided within 24 hours. And then up at the top, you just go to discussions and then click on the alumni and advancement section. Um, there you're going to find some really great discussions. Um, from your peers uh, about all kinds of really important topics. And so you can see some uh, have, you know, some responses, some have some eyeballs. Um, the more you add to this, the more powerful it is. So I would highly encourage you to share, share, and share um, on this site. So um, that is uh, uh, my quick overview. The third thing and last thing I do want to share is Anthology Together which is this summer, July 17th through the 20th, I recognize we are communicating with California state institutions um, and we will be in Nashville in July, which is a big challenge for most of you. But I would be remiss not to mention um, our, our annual conference. It's just a really great space to connect with other institutions, hear about best practices, both from anthology experts and from um, peer institutions. If you were there last year, um, it's even bigger and better this year. We learned a lot about how to really cultivate connections and networking for our alumni um, and advancement clients in particular, and just kind of build build these networks um, a little bit more um, strategically. So it's not a ton of people all together, but it's a ton of people all together with spaces for um, specific groups to get together uh, more intentionally. So. Um, if you have questions about it, let me know. We'd love to see you all there to represent the West. And as I mentioned, if you read your um, monthly emails from me, if you want to present, I would be willing to co-present with you. I will throw my name in the hat for up to two presentations, or I'm happy to connect you with other clients um, to present. But bottom line, would love to see you all there. It's just going to be a great uh, connection point and learning opportunity. So I'm going to pass it back over to Sam for the real final, final wrap ups. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. We appreciate you, all the work that you do. And of course, giving us those really important reminders uh, just now. Uh, really not too much for me to share other than um, tomorrow, we're really going to be looking at giving and all the fun strategies that come with that. Um, so really another opportunity for you guys to ask questions and connect and hear from each other and anthology. Uh, so really, we'll see you guys all tomorrow again at 9 a.m. Uh, on the, the same Zoom that you registered is probably on your calendar. So um, have an awesome afternoon and thank you all for your important work and see you guys shortly. So take care guys. <laughs>